And good morning to all you out there in the audience. Uh, is, welcome to the 2013 Open Sim Community Conference. Please uh, remain seated uh, if you, uh, during the conference, please. And uh, we will be taking questions today during our speaker's uh, presentation. First of all, I'd like to introduce Teresa Kinney Johnson, uh, an LLC airstrip. Eris Apps LLC, with extensive experience with multiple vo virtual worlds and game platforms. I'd also like to introduce David Fleeson. He's a chair of the 3D Web Roundtable with extensive experience in vir virtual worlds and education. He is a master training specialist and taught journalism and broadcasting for the U.S. military at the Defense Information School and recently developed a college undergrad course on engineering virtual worlds. He is currently a student at the Art Institute with a major in media, arts, and animation. Please give a good welcome to Teresa and David. Hello. Hello. Thank you. You want to start, Dave? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we're here today to talk about MUM. Let me just uh, ask a quick question, though, before we get started. Uh, can everybody hear us? Just want to make sure before we start that everybody, if there's anyone that's not able to, hopefully they'll let us know. Okay. All right. Looks good. Okay. Clearly, yes. All right. Very it's good. looking good. We'll just watch it. If anybody says they have a problem, we can try to work that out as we go. Uh, just want to make sure everybody's engaged because... Uh, I know what it's like to be at a presentation and, you know, you get about 15 minutes in waiting for it to start and you're not sure. So um, I just want to make sure everybody can get the dialogue. Um, and that's pretty much what we've been about in this project. We've really been trying to get the dialogue out there. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is MUM. MUM is the word, as I call this one, uh, which is the Metaverse Universal Marketplace. And this is a crowdsourced funding project that we're working on. Uh, we're looking to take forward soon into uh, uh, crowdsource funding um, to basically find a way to kickstart the metaverse. Uh, we've seen that there are things that uh, can be done that can make this uh, technology grow for business application as well as per per personal application as well. And um, I'll be speaking along with uh, Tessa here, who is uh, Teresa Kinney Johnson. Some of you might know her from. Uh, her open sim grid, as well as uh, uh, from work that she's done in Second Life, and even uh, a re recent build we did in Cloud Party. So there, there you have a little bit of our background. I won't go over it in any laborious detail. Um, you know, uh, Tessa's got extensive experience uh, when it comes to not only virtual worlds but MORPG type things. Um, a, a lot of different environments. Uh, she's got a pretty broad background in that area, as do I as well. Um, if you wonder about my son Zoo name, uh, what's your grid name, Tessa? Um, it's Spot on 3D, but uh, we'll be starting, um, we'll be working with a new grid uh, coming up with Aris apps and designing educational um, educational scenes for, uh, for either free or low cost for education. So we're really excited about that under the Keen Academy project. Okay. Thank you for giving me opportunity to say that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Jump in where you feel needed. You know, I'm happy to have you here today to, to co-present with me on this topic. Um, if some of you wonder about my name, Sun Tzu, I'll just give you a quick background on that. Um, I worked for the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, what was the uh, U.S. Joint Forces Command, and uh, one of the things I did while I was there, I was working as a futurist and a graphic designer. And um, uh, they wanted me to not only um, uh, help them to depict the future, but also to live it. And uh, for that reason, they had me go into Second Life as part of my day job. Uh, although most of it was actually after hours development, um, because of course, you know, like most developers, you get in there and you want to do all the extra touches, right? Um, so um, I was uh, depicting what the future would be like for the joint operating environment or the Joe. And one of the things that I was asked to do was to develop an avatar uh, as a, um, 
a virtual tour guide uh, based on Sun Tzu, who is the author of the Art of War book um, and uh, a strategist for the military. Um, he has uh, principles uh, that are still in use today by a number of people, inclu including pre presidents and prime ministers. So um, it's one of those time-tested and proven type things. So let's go on to our next slide then. Enough about us. Uh, session description. What we're basically going to talk about today, we're going to have four basic areas. Uh, first off, we're going to talk about the 3D Web Think Tank, where that came from. And we still hold these, by the way, each month. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into a bit of a background on that. Second thing is uh, I'm going to have Tessa go over the top ten list. Uh, we had uh, a number of people generate, uh, help us to generate a list. We brought a lot of ideas to the team ourselves, but uh, we also put the word out and uh, tried, tried to reach out to as many developers and uh, potential users of these technologies as we could. And we're always trying to grow that uh, community as well. And uh, we, out of that, we uh, pruned it down to a top 10 list of ideas of things that can make the metaverse move forward. The third thing is the uh, Metaverse Universal Marketplace, or MUM, as it's called. And um, that was the winner of the top 10 list. That was the most voted for category. Although we have uh, uh, used one of the other ones um, with our work in, like, Keen Academy. And uh, you can also see that here on... Um, the OSCC, there's a, the mind of Edgar Allan Poe. There's a build here that shows you some of the work that we did in Cloud Party as well. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with Q&A. Uh, also on questions and answers, we don't mind, you know, both me and Tessa have been in virtual environments long enough that we really don't mind if people are asking things as we're going through the presentation, as long as it's pertinent to the discussion. Um, so if you do have questions during the presentation, please feel free to um, put those into lo local text chat. We'll try to address them as, as, as we uh, go. Uh, if we don't get it during the presentation, we're also tracking them to try to make sure that we get them addressed by the end of the presentation. So. And Dave's much better at that than I am, so you got to kind of hit me overhead if you want specifically <laughs> me to ask a question, because... I'm not as good at multitasking as he is. Uh, well, I, I just got that left brain, right brain thing working all the time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's start off with the history of things, okay? You know, just like uh, college courses, is always good to start with the history first. Um, the, the way that this all began was um, I was working uh, for a college, uh, Rasmussen College in particular, and um, I was... Uh, I had stumbled across and seen that they were doing a program. They were looking to develop a course on engineering virtual worlds. It's an undergrad course uh, for their uh, game design and simulation program uh, at, at the bachelor degree level. So they developed. A, they wanted to develop an 11-week course. Well, I was going through it, and I knew a lot of different things when it came to virtual worlds, but I didn't know everything. You know, I don't think I ever will. Um, uh, so what I started to do is I knew a lot of people and I went around and I started asking people um, in different subject matter areas like they started to ask me things about psychology of virtual worlds you know I didn't have a clue I mean I had some impressions myself but I didn't know all the particulars so I started to go around and I started to ask people in these different disciplines um, you know what they uh, what they knew about it and we did interviews so I did interviews and posted on YouTube, um, and that gave me a chance to, you know, be able to have some people with deeper knowledge of these subjects than I had. Um, even interviewed uh, Chris Collins from Tipidian on virtual economies, for example, because uh, Chris has got extensive experience in that in that area from his work at Linden Lab. Um, so as I put this stuff together, um, one of them I was asking about was. Um, uh, some of the challenges, the engineering challenges, the architecture challenges when it comes to virtual worlds. And I, I had known of Tessa a little bit from her work when she was with uh, Spot on 3D in Second Life. And I had come across her grid when I was looking at all the different grids that were out there and comparing the apples to the oranges more, more so, 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 so to speak. And that's when I came up on Tessa and met a lot of folks I knew, like Agile Bill uh, was there as well. And... Um, I met some other uh, content creators and things, and uh, we started to uh, do a discussion. And when I did my interview with her, unlike the other ones where I was uh, interviewing a single person, 
um, I interviewed a whole group of people in, in a roundtable discussion. And thus, and that was like, I think, what month was that? Do you remember, Tessa? Yeah, I think that was like January or February. And yeah. um, I just I offered to bring a bunch of the contacts I had in the virtual worlds community and to meet with him so they could share their experience with him as well. And we, we went and we did a video stream of that for the school uh, so that they could use that as part of their course. Because you always want to make things that are fun to watch and, you know, Make, bringing the students in virtual, first you got to whet their appetites a lot of times too, so the videos help. Um, and then Tessa says, you know, hey, you know, this was really fun. Let's do this every month. <laughs> so we, we started the 3D Web Think Tank, you know. And I, I know there are a lot of different groups out there, like Avacon's an awesome uh, company that's doing a lot of great stuff like this conference, for example. Um, there's a lot of different groups that I think are all focused on very similar ideas. And I don't really see that as a challenge or a problem. I see that as a great thing because the more uh, uh, innovative minds you have coming to a table to address an issue of importance like virtual worlds are right now, um, the better. You know, the more chance that we're going to succeed. It might be a piece of my idea. It might be a piece of uh, Maria's. It might be a piece of Doug Maxwell's. Uh, it, it can be a piece of everybody's ideas out there that actually becomes what the future of the metaverse is. But it's, you know, it's through that engagement, it's through us you know, coming together and talking out these things and helping each other to take things forward. So that was really our big focus up front. We wanted to move the metaverse forward. What kinds of things can we do to make it better? Now, one of the things that kind of came to mind with me on that concept is... Uh, the uh, topic of education. When we take a look at education, um, a lot of times there's focus on things like testing, exams, standards of learning, for example, is one that's really big where I'm at in Virginia. Um, and that has a focus on, you know, if we give you a test and you pass the test, that will show your success. I've seen other... Um, I've seen other types of approaches where we do things like gamification of education and we do things to more incentivize the children to learn or adults in, in, in a college case as well to learn. And I think that there's a lot more effectiveness, especially with today's generations, when we incentivize things and when we make the environment fertile for learning. All right. I think it's the same way when it comes to virtual worlds. If we can do things to make this soil more fertile, if we can make the metaverse um, so that it has greater potential for growth, you're making it so that the seeds can be planted and that the metaverse can continue to grow on past what we have right now. And I think in a case like that, you kind of let it, let it uh, focus on the direction that people want to take it instead of structuring it in a way that it has to go along a certain path. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, so in a case like this, one of the things that we, we've prob probably most of the people in this audience have seen was, you know, the changes with Second Life and the terms of service. You know, there were certain things that motivated Linden Lab to do that. Um, I won't comment on those, but um, I, I do think that um, as a result of that, it caused a rift in the content creator environment. It caused a lot of content creators to leave. Now, some of them went to Open Simulator. Some of them went to other uh, game engines or other applications. And some just pulled out completely. Because for some of these folks, they are 3D modelers, animators, and the like. And they might be working at major studios and this was a supplementary income for them. So um, how do we get those kind of creative people back to the fold to be able to uh, develop content and help us to uh, provide for a more robust metaverse and a metaverse that's more usable and more accessible and you know that we're reaching an audience beyond the ones that we've reached so far. That's where I think we need to make the soil rich. If we make the soil rich, people will come, people will use it. 
it will increase the potential for what the environments can be used for. But I think in order to do that, we also need to see beyond what we've always done in the past. You know, we all have a set of lenses that we look at the world through. That was one of the things that working at Joint Forces Command kind of taught me as we were doing the futures research. We all are a product of our history, you know, our culture. So we want to see beyond just what Second Life has done in the past, just what Open Simulator can do in the past, and we wanted a broad approach to the metaverse as a whole. So that's what we're looking at with the 3D Web Think Tank. What can we do to move the metaverse forward? And we've been meeting each month for these roundtables, uh, the first Sunday of every month. Um, the website is, um, if you haven't seen that, let me drop the link for you. It's uh, http colon slash slash www.3dwebroundtable.org. Hopefully I got that right. Web roundtable. Yeah, okay. So uh, we meet each uh, month on the first Sunday. Uh, we might uh, put out a thing to check that date to see if maybe there's a better date that we should move it to. So I have heard back some things that other folks have conflicts that would love to be there at the meetings but can't necessarily make them. So we, we, we might change, change to that date. But what we're doing is we're shaping this. And at first it was we were getting together as a group of people that were interested in making the metaverse better. And then we started to get ideas. Like you can see this one here. There's a cloud, um, a word cloud that shows uh, some of the discussion we did on customizing the user experience. You know, and if you're not familiar with word clouds, basically the words that are used the most are the ones that are going to be the largest. So in this case, it gave us an idea of what are they looking for. The things that are biggest give you an idea of what types of uh, things that are most important to them, and that was based on the local chat. And then we came up with this, the top ten list. And I'll let uh, Tesla. Can you can you go over this for us, please? Sure, sure. Um, we put out uh, ideas that uh, there were about fifty ideas because <laughs> everybody had a voice, but we narrowed it down to ten that uh, that we felt were the most viable a as a group. Um, and of course, um, we had everybody vote for it because we didn't feel like we should be the decision makers. The community should be. Um, we opened up for voting. It was uh, where you, um, you know, it was. Um, uh, wow. We had the uh, marketplace, which is um, the idea is to have a universal system of de delivering content and even stuff that's scripted and animated through the metaverse um, seamlessly so that the creators can log into a place, list their item, and deliver it everywhere. And because we know the users have been complaining um, about not being able to use their content across a multitude of grids and that they're no longer really secluded to one. They have Everybody has a home grid where they spend most of their time, but they definitely go to events on other grids and want to look like themselves. So we really feel strongly to to um, really establish the universal avatar, it's absolutely necessary to have your avatar stuff. You you can't look like yourself if you don't do it. For example, I came in today thinking I was perfectly dressed, and I apparently had several outfits on. <laughs> and that's because I had to kind of piecemeal it together in last night. And people shouldn't have to go through that hassle just to have themselves with an authentic avatar they're very comfortable in. Um, they would still have to dress themselves the ideas, but they would at least have the inventory there. Um, and we feel this can be done through like um, um, a trusted grid network kind of thing. Um, Med Academy is actually, um, and these ideas are for anybody to use and run with. It's not just for us. These are ideas the community put forward. Um, and we, I went ahead and decided to jump on the Med Academy idea, which was for um, a universal education system um, with pre-made uh, learning simulations. And that got a lot of votes. It actually was right up there for a while. It was like one and one, and we didn't know which one was going to win. Um, standardization was about, you know, creating standards for, for uh, running grids and user accounts and 
things uh, like that to keep things more um, standardized so that we have some similarity from one grid to the other as far as basic technology. Um, and on that but, one too, by the way, um, we had also, I'd been involved with the IEEE's group uh, looking to uh, create standards for virtual worlds. And you haven't heard much from them lately, but it's because they're in the final processes of going through these standards and finalizing them. So they are working on the standards, and part of what we're doing here is incentivizing people actually using those types of standards. Putting them into practical use, the idea you know, of what they're, they're proposing. And um, I think the Metaverse Marketplace, the MUM project, could actually be one part of many to push that through and get people to actually adopt. Because um, you have to give people a carrot stick anytime you start standardizing to in, you know, get them the impulse to actually jump on it. Um, Mobile Viewer, which as you, as you, many of you know, Lumia has a wonderful Android uh, phone viewer, but it's more of snapshots um, than active content. Um, so we really need to work on that. So that was one of the other um, ones and it got high level of votes comparatively because we got like, a, we got exactly 100 votes. Um, and this was really early on, by the way. And then the suitcase idea was sort of like Diva Distro. I mean, Diva's um, a suitcase with Hypergrid where you have a secured uh, content that you can put in a suitcase and move virtually and, and you know, that like that authentic avatar. And I think we could still do that um, outside of even the MUM project if we got a general good collection of open sourced um, content for avatar creation. And I think that would be another way we could maybe bring that in earlier. Um, number six is the virtual uh, converter. I can't remember what that one was. What was that? What was virtual converter? Um, that was for... Let me look at my notes here. I've got it. <laughs> Sorry. It's been a no, while okay. since I looked at these. And the library archive was, um, you know, a, a universal library where people could come. And, um, and I think we were going to focus on virtual world information, obviously, since that's something we could really throw a lot of stuff at. But it wouldn't preclude the idea of bringing in more um, assets from other libraries and interconnecting libraries from around the world and giving a virtual environment for people to come in and actually meet and join and discuss to have discussion groups in this uh, virtual archive, uh, library okay. archive. The virtual converter was uh, develop a web-based software as a service uh, tool to easily convert in-world content, prims and sculpts from Second Life uh, yeah. Sim, into mesh with identity verification to protect IP rights. Half of that has already been done with the recent change with the Singularity Viewer. Now you can yeah. export out to OBJ or DAE files. So um, they're working on the textures next. What would be nice is something on the IP rights issue. Um, I, I know a lot of folks are looking at that. that, that that's a, a big focus area for a lot of people is to be able to have the IP rights uh, continue with the items instead of being able to be stripped off of them. Okay, Kokuyua. Kokua. Kokua. That's like a Hawaii viewer, right? Great, I've, Tanya. I've That's great to hear. Times. Thanks. By the way, hi. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, also, the library archive was also designed for scripting in particular as far as the virtual world um, contribution so that people would have one place to really contribute in a very identifiable place. So I really think that's a good idea. And if anybody wants to run with these ideas, they can. Um, this is not like owned by uh, three, the 3D Roundtable. It was actually an idea to kind of push ideas out for others to pick up and take off with. Yeah, the most, the most important thing for us is that we move things forward. Yeah. And, you know, if, if it's... And help if we can, you yeah. know. So, um, like, you know, once we get this first crowdsource funding, I'm sure we'll learn a lot about how to do it. And we'd love to help um, others by sharing our information. Um, 
identity management was more about um, like an open ID kind of idea where your your identity and there's some reputation kind of thing that's become really um, kind of a big factor now with um, we've seen bully blogging that tries to you know can really affect somebody's reputation and it may or may not be valid the complaints against it and the idea also is about who can you trust to do business with or to trade fairly with and that that is becoming more and more uh, a big point without outing yourself publicly about your your real life identity to have kind of a safe way to know who you can deal with and um, if they can be trusted I think that's becoming more and more a big issue yeah. um, without becoming like a Facebook I think we all now realize Facebook has value but they also aren't what they kind of portrayed they be or they've changed uh, we all kind of feel like we're being spied on now at least that's the impression I get and it's kind of mm, weirds me out and I'm so glad I don't do anything personal on Facebook now because um, it really kind of freaks me out so the we expression don't... the expression what starts on Facebook stays on Facebook yes. is not really true <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah because employers now look at it as part of their vetting for you know employees and uh, prospective employees and that's kind of scary because whatever you did at 15 is still going to be there you know unless they give us a way to take it off which I think is kind of unfair for the next generation quite honestly but the idea is to create that where we don't have this problem with privacy issues being bled into the identity process unless somebody wants to I'm I've always been real open about who I am and what I'm about and where I've come from and even where I live because I feel like um, that that is the only way for me to validate to people that I'm trustworthy and when I do business with them. Um, virtualist Lisa, um, that mean, was more can, yours. Can I jump in there one sure. sec real quick before we continue, Tessa? Uh, Sean had just mentioned something there um, a, a moment ago as far as, you know, he hopes that folks do things the same way. I think a lot of that gets to the engagement, people being engaged with each other on the topics and you know being able to know who's who's working what and being able to you know, reach out within that community um, that's something I think in the future is an important area is to get the 3d web roundtable or whatever it becomes in the future it morphs into but to get this whole topic with the metaverse engaged in the World Wide Web Consortium um, so that we actually start to to uh, design an architecture that fits within the web browsers, you know, so that we're thinking about these things and it's becoming a topic of discussion within that community, because it's it, it shouldn't be a separate viewer for the World Wide Web and for the 3D worlds. If you do that, you're going to have an isolated approach that's only going to reach a certain market potential. If you want to get this to the point where it's reaching, and it's not just a matter of I make something that uses an application that works within a web viewer. No, we need to get past that to the point where it's actually part of the decision making that people are thinking about it as they're developing the web of the future. Yes. And I think that's key. We have to think about that. We have to think about, you know, we don't want to limit the options, but we want to make sure the architecture can support the options. Yeah, and I think he's, Sean may also be talking about the fact that Meerkat and um, Singularity, there's like three different ways of backing things up and they're not compatible. I mm -hmm. think he's, he also may be intimating that we have like one um, path to import and export that um, is, you know, more cohesive. And, and that is part of standardization. But I think um, we don't have to wait for IEE to do that. I think we can do that as a community and more lead them because, you know, we're on the ground. We're doing this every day. We're the ones who need this kind of flexibility. Um, so I, I think that's the, the really important thing. And that's all about us getting together. And that's why, you know, we kind of threw this, this group together and started meeting because there was really um, not a body of, of real cohesiveness to the grid owners and to the users and to the creators and there needs to be one and not saying we're the only group that can do that obviously if somebody chooses to start a group we'll definitely support that as well but as long as we're going 
um, on the whole theme of to come together and to make these changes together. Um, I think it's really important. Virtualista, could you talk about that, Dave? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm just going to wrap up these last two so we can get to the mum part because I think that's what yeah. a lot of you have really come for. Uh, Virtualista was a uh, idea as far as socializing the shopping experience uh, where basically, and, and this also has to do a little bit with the prefab stuff that we'll be touching on in a bit, but uh, taking things so that you can basically uh, put things together with prefabs and make things into, you're kind of like gamifying the virtualization. And the final one we have there is the Metaverse Mentor, which is basically developing a game or learning tool that would uh, teach virtual world skills like 3D modeling and texturing, for example. Um, so let's go to the next slide and get to the mum, the mum topic. All right. Um, what we're looking at on this, and I think we're a little bit unique compared to other ones, there's been a lot of other marketplaces out there. So why mum? Um, I'm looking at with mum, you know, and it, we're still at the developmental process. It's conceptual at this point. Uh, we're working on starting off a uh, putting things together for for a um, crowdsource funding project, uh, but we're at the point where we're really trying to think out the ideas and think of innovative ways to approach this instead of just doing the same thing that everybody else has always done before. Uh, we've shown in the past that we have technology that can allow us to deliver to multiple virtual worlds. Uh, our, 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 um, our people on the team believe that they can engineer this in a way that will also reach into other places that we haven't reached before. So as you can see here in this grid agnostic approach, we're talking about everything from uh, multiple virtual worlds, not just Second Life, not just some open sim grids, uh, but also other places, um, I can't say for sure right now, but, you know, possibly Cloud Party, possibly IM View, uh, possibly Blue Mars, uh, possibly other ones that aren't even invented yet. Um, but it's more about creating an architectural structure that can reach the multitude of environments instead of just targeting it for a single grid. We really yeah. think it's important that it have a multiplicity. Go ahead, Tessa. Yeah, and with the oncoming of MeSH to everyone in OpenSim, um, that that really is the bridge gap that was needed to be made because that's what all these other environments use is MeSH. So now that we're coming to a common denominator and we have converter tools at least to um, prim to MeSH, uh, you know, we need, still need Sculpt to MeSH. And I would rather see that on a web page instead of on a, a client or at least have that additional choice. But that, I think, is the Siemens that's going to bond this and make this really workable to go far outside the open sim community and therefore give the the creators and the users a much more flexible system um, to utilize their virtual environments. And, and some of this stuff hasn't exactly been done before, but in discussions I've had with some of the companies that have delivered avatars uh, to places like Unity 3D environments, um, we know that certain things can be done. Um, we're pretty sure we can get it done within a Unity environment uh, where it's already online as a virtual environment. Uh, we think we can probably do the same thing with Unreal as well, but some of this is going to take testing, obviously, uh, to prove what we're talking about. Um, so, but we don't want to limit our scope up front. We want to show that there is the potential and, and see what can be done with the technology. Um, the copy protection, uh, do you have any ideas on that one, Tessa? Yeah, we've, we've thought around a lot of ideas, and I'm not convinced that it should be... Um, on the marketplace itself, not that it can't be tied to them, but a couple ideas we've had is a a creator's uh, clearinghouse where they would list pictures of all their items, where they sell their items, any copyrights that they have list, you know, they actually have legally done, and that way I as a shopper can see a link to that on their sale page, um, on their listing page, and I can make sure that yes, this is a legitimate creator and if they don't have that link then it's going to kind of stand out blaringly that maybe they're not quite proper and and if it <laughs> if it looks familiar and it you go to like Lilith Heart and you see her trees 
then you go to that clearing house and you don't see that marketplace as a correct vendor um, or grid that she's actually okay to sell on, then that gives us, the users, a real easy way to say, you know, I want to honor that creator. I'm going to go get it a different way and try to do it the proper way. Um, that's one way to do it. And the other way that we thought of at, that we could help out um, directly is to create a system where uh, creators can um, have a legal fund that sort of like DMCA insurance because we all know what happens when a DMCA is filed. It's kind of a he said, she said thing. And then the, the grid has no choice. They're not a legal body. They can't decide who's right or wrong legally. So the only thing, the option that creator has at that point is to go to court and that starts at ten thousand um, dollars so for all intents and purposes it's very difficult for a creator to actually legally protect their stuff um, no matter how much they've done right on the copyright issue thing no matter how many filings they have it really comes down to taking it to court and bringing that person to task so the idea is to offer them a way to do a subscription based kind of thing maybe and pay so much per month and it becomes a legal fund that will help anybody who has a very serious DMCA issue. And we have all seen it. There's there's a lot of times it's just, I didn't know, I purchased this from so-and-so yeah. and now we found out it's not good, let me take it off, you know, kind of thing. Those things are 90% of the time the case. But there is that 10% where you have somebody who is really intent on illicit um, selling of content that just isn't theirs and those are the people that need to be brought to task I feel you know but only the creators can do that because they're the IP holders mm -hmm. and then you have oh god the more complicated issue is if they use kits so they have third party IP rights too it becomes extremely complicated and extremely hard to solve yeah. even from a legal perspective let me go over a few of the comments that we've had because there's been a, a bunch that flowed away you're talking to us so, yes. um just basically in a nutshell, if I can kind of, I'll, I'll try to address these quickly on each of the items. Uh, you were asking, Doug, I think it was, was the one who was asking about uh, the IP protection, um, how we intend to do this. First off, what we're looking at is that our content creators would have a process where um, they are identifiable um, so that uh, via PayPal, um, so that... Um, there is no anonymity of who is selling things. Now, that doesn't mean that your uh, real-world identification is posted online for anyone in the world to see, but at least uh, the company that's running MUM, or that would probably be a nonprofit, is able to identify positively who the people are that are providing the content. So a lot of times what we find is that when you put things in the light instead of the darkness, um, people tend to behave themselves more. So we're looking to create an environment for the marketplace that makes the, the market uh, much more uh, uh, viable for use. The other yeah, thing we we're looking at is we might be using some kinds of technology like uh, intellectual property auto scanning. There are technologies out there right now on the market. Um, Google has one, for example, inside of uh, their uh, search engine capabilities that allow you to look at an image and tell anything that's related to that image on the net. We think that these technologies could be developed over time to be able to tell if somebody is uh, trying to sell a good that is stolen. I or if it's something... on that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's ways that we can use technology over time. And, you know, you talked, too, about... There, there was a question there, too, about um, with, um, you know, what about the mesh, the the... The rigging is going to be different for the different environments. Uh, these things can be worked with technology. It takes work to get there, obviously. But we think that it can. it's not insurmountable. Right. Uh, we're already seeing right now they're starting to do things with mesh to make it conform to the size of the avatar. But a lot of times it takes being able to take these principles and use them across different environments. As you can see on this one right here, what we're looking at is purchase options. Allowing it so that if you come and let's say you just wanted it in single use, you wanted to just use it in SL, you just wanted to use it on a single grid, maybe on Kitely, for example, um, or Avenation, whatever, you know, you could use it for a single use. Or maybe you want to buy it for multiple use. 
you know, we have a carte blanche thing that you can use it on a host of sims, or a host of grids, rather. Uh, that could be an option. All right. And then uh, commercial use, you know, if you're using it, but you want to be able to sell it uh, to, uh, for use on a commercial contract, maybe there'd be a different price for that. And then maybe special pricing specifically for education and nonprofit. So these are some of the things we're, we're thinking about as we create the marketplace. MUM would give you options so that you could make more use of it. And it would also give the content creators a much larger base of an audience to reach. And we can also encourage a thing called prefabs or kit makers so that people could be reselling things basically um, so that they would use these kits to make things. We've already seen that in SL and in OpenSim where folks are uh, taking things and reusing it and adding their own creativity to it to make things even more so out legally, of it. Legally, legally. Legally, yeah, <laughs> legally. So that just gives you kind of a snap view. A couple things I'd just like to uh, point out on this slide real quick. If you look on the bottom left there, you see, and this is just a conceptual view of MUM, you know, a, a, a first shot at it. But having a star system where you as a, um, as a uh, customer can actually go in there and uh, put down, you know, how good this product was, where you can post comments, where you can have a subscription plan that would allow you to uh, purchase uh, uh, things so that as that content creator releases things, you know, each month, you get a sampling of things, you know, as part of your subscription. You know, a lot of this is kind of bringing things together. And then you see the last one, socialize. I'm not sure if that's the right word yet, but the thing is to get it to the point where you have control you have a way to add two things so that you can add to the content, like in this case, the metadata for the tags, a, a way to go to socialize it where you can take it and you can uh, send it out to your friends and let them see it. And, you know, it becomes a social shopping experience. So what we're looking at here is increasing the ease of use for users and creators. Basically, we're looking to change the way you shop. And not just Second Life, not just OpenSim, but virtual worlds across the board, as well as real life. Um, intellectual property empowerment, uh, you know, finding ways to help the content creators protect their IP. And a lot of this is in the way that you structure the cell of it. If I, if I make an environment where cheating is not allowed and there's things to prevent it from happening, it makes it a lot less likely. Now, can somebody still go into a grid and steal things? That's always a possibility in any environment. But at the same time, if you are structuring things so it's not profitable for them to do so, that makes a difference. And that will lessen the amount of theft then it will probably just become more theft for personal use for the most part. Uh, virtual essence and physical essence. That's kind of a concept we've been kicking around. Uh, you all know how you can save out your avatar and give them a, um, and basically give them a, um, uh, uh, you basically have saved out your outfit. Well, what we're talking about is taking the virtual essence of an avatar. Things like the skin, the shape, the eyes, the hair, the makeup, and saving that as a virtual essence. And then when you come to a the website for MUM, instead of having to download things, put on a demo version with a little sign over the top of your head, now you can actually see what you look like online because it puts you into the clothing. Now take that a step forward. What if we did that in the real world? What if we did that for real world shopping where we had you also take a physical essence of yourself. We're thinking about what if we put boots out to at places like maybe at San Diego, uh, you know, down at Daytona, Fort Lauderdale. You know, we could start it off with the colleges first and see how, how well it works there. But you know, you basically, you know, you're 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 in your beach attire and um, you um, you go in, you, you do a three sixty scan of yourself and now when you're doing your real life shopping online, you can see yourself in the clothing. You know, a big difference there in how we shop. And we can socialize that experience. You can send it to others. They can see what you look like in it. They can comment back to you. It becomes more of a socialized shopping experience. And then also your essence, you know, especially with the virtual essence, you would have the possibility to, you know, maybe splice your essences. Maybe somebody sees your essence and says, hey, you know, you know, 
I, I really like the way that you did your avatar. Is there a way that I can get a copy of your essence? And maybe you splice your essence and their essence together. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on there. Uh, okay, possibilities. Dave, we're, we're running yeah. out of time. We're wrapping up. So um, everybody sees that the slide deck is online. Um, there's the website for it. And also we're looking to, paralyze, uh, to have parallel real-life sales for it as well. And basically, in a nutshell, what we're looking to do is grow the metaverse by incentivizing virtual standards by making it profitable for people to use them. If a content creator can get 20-fold more of customers by going to a site like Moan, that makes it worth their while. That makes the metaverse grow. That brings people who have some of the high-end capabilities to take this to take this forward. So there's a little bit on the path forward for the crowdfunding. Um, and we invite you to our um, our uh, our monthly meetings, like I said, right now we're doing them each month on the first Sunday. Um, and uh, we'll take any questions. Are there any questions that we didn't address already? I, I wanted to address somebody's question out there. Doug asked if we're self policing. Um, it's incredibly difficult for any one entity to handle the IP issues solo um, and incredibly expensive. And we know what we have to offer through the MUM project can't cost a whole lot, if anything, um, to most people. Because obviously, you know, it, it, we're in a recession and the, the demand of marketplaces are ran where the cost is nothing to the user and very little to the creator. Um, so we're just trying to incentivize, way, incentivize ways for creators to empower themselves and give them the tools they need and the money they need to actually take to task the people they need to. Because honestly, we can't legally represent a creator. Um, we, we don't know any agreements they have with other people that they may be working with or people they've given special permissions to um, or how much third-party product they're using. Only the creator can take that under under their own steam. We can just provide them a way to do it effectively. And, of course, your sticky IP ID idea is absolutely a great idea. Yeah, so and a lot, of this, a lot of this, too, is, you know, we, we, we don't profess to have all the answers. Ah. We're, that's why we did a think tank is we want to try to get the ideas out there and start to focus on how we can implement them. But definitely, Doug, we do need to address this in to what the approach is in order to be able to get it to the point uh, that we understand the funding level that's needed to to get it there. Because when, when you put this out for crowdsource, you, you need to have a good community to support it. And you also need to have a very clear definition of how you're going to get there and have goals for what you expect to achieve. Volkmar is asking, uh, where are you going to, what are you going to do with customers who still visit the store in world? I mean, for what should a content creator open his own place or run a sim, make it, make it nice with when all his customers buy all over online the web? Um, real life experiences show that since mega stores like Amazon or others come up, smaller stores have to close because nobody goes there. I agree. You know, um, we're working on a system right now for a new grid for a customer. Um, um, that will allow in-world sales on the ground and through the marketplace. But I think it's really important we understand that everything's going to iPhones and iPad, or not just iPhones, Android phones, smartphones and iPhones, uh, tablets and iPads, and much more mobile devices. And that requires the ability for them to be able to see the product in a pictorial format because as it stands right now, that technology cannot support a, a, an interactive full functional virtual world experience. Um, but that does not mean they should not be stores. Um, I, you know, every grid I've been on has a, a marketplace for them. Um, I think giving them the option to do both is, is really key. Yeah. And I think people shop differently and, I'm not looking to do something that threatens the vendors that are out there already. I mean, if they want to shop in world, that's fine. 
And in some cases, like for example, when I shop for certain things, I'll buy them right over the web. And especially if I could see myself in clothing, I could do that instead of having to go in world and put something on, you know, that has this like, uh, hey, I'm a noob sign over the top of my head. Um, you know, I, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather just see what it looks like online instead of going in world and doing that. But there are other things where I'm going to want to actually, I'm a tactile person. I like to sometimes go there and feel things to get an idea. Is this exactly what I thought it was? You know, before I actually hit that, that click to uh, buy button. So that's, you know, it all depends. I think there's going to be various things for various people. Not everybody shops the same way. But part of what we're looking at on this is not just another marketplace. We're looking at changing the way we shop, both in virtual and in real life. Zuza asked about um, us being an authority. That's not the idea. The idea is provide a means for them to be their own authority creators, like the clearinghouse, where they can point their customers to that to verify that they're buying from an authorized dealer, um, like the sticky IP. They have to implement those. We can't. Uh, we can't be the police of the of IP. We yeah. can only make sure that they have the capability to tag into any IP they choose to use. So it's more about the creators and their choices to protect their IP than about us protecting it. Well, thank thank you all for coming. We appreciate well, you uh, coming right out. out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for coming. We ap appreciate your coming out. If you have any additional questions or if you want to join the dialogue, uh, please uh, look at the uh, website um, and attend our next events. We do them once a month. And uh, be, be, be glad to uh, have your ideas as part of it. I mean, this is some, something not just for, for us. This is something for the metaverse as a whole. And if anybody would like to come to the Keen Academy thing, I'd be glad to talk and text. I'm sure Sonny, I mean, um, Dave would be happy to be there too. And because uh, I feel like there's lots of questions that we haven't been able to answer. Um, just cover the Keen Academy thing here you know, on the grid. Is that okay with you, Dave? Yeah, that's fine. Hey, thanks, everyone. Okay, and we wish to thank David and Teresa for a very interesting and provocative presentation. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to stick around and uh, answer a few more questions. And uh, again, you can catch them on the uh, on their websites. And uh, uh, that'll be wrapping that up for this part of our conference. Um, we want to remind everybody that they can look up the conference schedule at http colon slash slash conference dot opensimulator.org. Again, let's give a big round of applause for David and Teresa. Thank you very much. <laughs>